and, and how did how did these shape the events that happened? Because I believe Ayn Rand believe I learned this from Ayn Rand and Leonard Peikoff that ideas shape history. They shape the future. They shape human events. They shape your life as an individual, and they shape our lives as a culture and as a it is as a it is a historical phenomenon. And uh, you know now we want to move on to the main topic. Sure. Uh, but just I just wanted to give a comment. You know, honestly speaking, I never even heard of Ayn Rand or yourself or even the uh, philosophy of objectivism until I started prepping for this interview. And uh, you know, doing a Google search only yields like biased and inaccurate data of different things. And even too, I feel our listeners probably have, don't even know who Ayn Rand is, considering they were born way past her timeline. And the most significant history event was either the 2008 Great Recession or 9/11. And so, you know, as the head of the Ayn Rand Institute, I'm pretty sure you know a lot about Ayn Rand, her life, her philosophies. Sure. So could you tell our listeners who was Ayn Rand? So I, I do, I need to make one more correction in my bio. Mm -hmm. I'm not technically the head of the Ayn Rand Institute in terms of CEO, I was mm -hmm. for 17 years. Mm -hmm. I'm now the chairman of the board. Oh. So, uh, you know, Tal Tzfani is the, is the CEO of the Ayn Rand Institute. But uh, so just with that, I don't want to get into trouble. So just put that down <laughs> here. Um, Sure. I mean, Ayn Rand was a was a, a, a writer, novelist, and a uh, and a philosopher. Mm -hmm. And uh, for most uh, Gen Zers, but really for anybody, uh, the thing you want to really read if, is is the Fountainhead mm -hmm. and Atlas Shrugged. Uh, you know, hopefully some of your viewers have, will have read the books because the books are out there. Mm -hmm. They're in the culture. They're part of the culture. And and even some in some schools particularly in the United States, at least. I'm not sure how much in Canada, but also in Canada, from at least during the, my years as, as head of the Ayn Rand Institute, it was certainly the case in Canada. Uh, Fountainhead and Anthem and Atlas Shrugged were books being read in high schools in Canada. We get a lot of uh, uh, Canadian kids writing into our high school essay contests. Uh, we did that in, in the US and UK in a lot of English speaking countries, even, even in non-English speaking countries, we, we, the largest, we have the largest high school essay contest in the world. Uh, we get thousands and thousands of essays. Uh, and that's how partially how we keep Ayn Rand alive in, in, for mm -hmm. the younger generations. You know, people go online and look for scholarships yeah. <laughs> and, and they, find, they find the essay contest and they apply. And a lot of people have won a lot of money from us. So Ayn Rand was a novelist, uh, primarily, and, and a philosopher. She was born in 1905 in St. Petersburg, Russia. Uh, she was born to a, uh, a, her father was a pharmacist. He owned a pharmacy at the, at the bottom of the building in which they lived. Uh, he, so he had a, a, a reasonable, a nice business, a, a reasonable income. And then, of course, uh, in 1914, you had the Russian Revolution. You had the rise of communism. Uh, literally, the square where this revolution starts is in St. Petersburg, right outside of the pharmacy, right outside of their home. She witnessed it. So she lived through the Civil War in Russia during the revolution. Um, and, uh, and of course, when the revolution was won by the communists, uh, the pharmacy was taken away, nationalized. Uh, their apartment was taken away. They had to share it with other families. So she witnessed was a real witness to life under communism and what that meant uh, as a teenager. Uh, she, she went to university, but it was quite clear that she stayed in the, in, in the Soviet Union. They would kill her. I mean, she was an independent thinker from, the, from very young, uh, and she, she could not hold her tongue. I mean, she, she expressed her views, and she was going to get into trouble, and there's no question about that. So uh, in a small window of opportunity in the 1920s, when Lenin allowed people to leave in the late 1920s for study abroad type things, mm -hmm. she managed to get a visa to the United States to come and research film. She was mm -hmm. studying film. Um, and she, got, she had a cousin in the US who owned a movie theater in Chicago and he wrote a letter and she got out. Her family knew she would never come back. Mm -hmm. So she got on a train, left, they, they knew they would never see her again. Yeah. Um, and she came to the United States, came to Chicago with nothing, um, then went uh, to Hollywood because her dream was to be a writer. And, uh, and she loved movies, so she wanted to be a screenwriter. She wanted to write for the movies. Uh, and on her first day in Hollywood, true story, she, she goes to Cesar B. DeMille Studios. And you guys probably don't know who Cesar B. DeMille was, but <laughs> one of the great pioneers of the movie industry and 
and one of the most famous directors in, in movie history. And she goes to the studio and, uh, you know, she has a letter of introduction. They say, you know, don't call us, we'll call you. And uh, she walks out of the studio and this Cecil B. DeMille driving by in this massive convertible. Um, and this is, you know, the late 1920s. And, and she stares at him. She's this little Russian girl, she stares at him. And he, and he stops the car and he says, you know, why are you staring at me? What, you know, what, what's, what are you doing here? And she tells him, you know, I'm from Russia and she has this thick Russian accent and I, I want to get into the movies. I, I, want to, I want to learn everything there is about the industry. I want to write for the movies. And he says, okay, well, get in the car. I'll, I'll, let, me, let me show you. So he takes her uh, to where they're filming The King of Kings, his, his uh, movie, silent movie about Jesus Christ, right? And he, and he, he says, here's a week pass to the lot so you can learn about the movies. So she becomes an extra on the movie. <laughs> and for years, she has all kinds of end, odds and ends jobs uh, in the movie business, uh, trying to learn. And ultimately, she writes scripts, she gets movies made, she, she reviews scripts, uh, so she becomes part of the industry. Mm -hmm. uh, she also writes plays, and some of them are ultimately performed on Broadway and in LA. She writes her first novel, We the Living, which is a, it's close to an autobiographical novel that she ever wrote. It's about growing up in a communism in the Soviet Union and what life is like. It's a powerful novel. Uh, I recommend it to everybody. It's a fairly easy read and, and, and it's beautiful and it's, it's heart-wrenching because of you see what communism really is about. Uh, the, she then writes a, a little novelletta called, a novella called Anthem which is published in the UK first and only then in the United States, a, a dystopian type novella. Uh, would take you about a couple of hours to read, definitely worth reading. It's very short, but again, very powerful. And here you can already start seeing the themes. Individualism versus collectivism comes out of this. What is the purpose of life? Is it to live for others or to live for yourself that comes out of this novella? Then uh, she writes a book called The Fountainhead and The Fountainhead is um, rejected by 12 publishers, but when it comes out, finally there's a publisher who brings it out and they, they don't quite believe in it. They don't print a lot of copies, but it becomes a bestseller um, and uh, word of mouth. And they have to go back into the printing presses and reprint and it's still a bestseller. It still sells uh, tens of thousands and, and sometimes hundreds of thousands of copies of, a year um, uh, around the world today. It's been translated into almost every language out there. It's it's there are more copies of Fountainhead uh, that sell in other languages than in English. Oh, wow. It's a huge international uh, bestseller, and and I think if you want to understand, I mean, I think it's the American novel. I think it's the American novel. Forget Scott F. Fitzgerald. Yeah. That's <laughs> you know doesn't come close. The Fountainhead represents America, and it's in its deepest sense and what it means and what America represents. And then uh, after the found head, she wrote her, what, what, what is a magnus opus, Atlas Shrugged. Um, it took her 12 years to write. By the time she published this, every publisher wanted it. Uh, they had, they, you know, they, they bid for it. Uh, and uh, when it came out, it was an instant bestseller. And again, it sells hundreds of thousands of copies, tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of copies every single year in every language out there. Uh, and it's it's everybody should read Atlas Shrugged. It's a it's a it's a profound book uh, where she really summarizes her entire philosophy. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of her life. So this was fifty. Uh, uh, Head was published in forty five. Uh, Atlas Shrugged was published in nineteen fifty seven. I know ancient history for you guys. Yeah. And then she spends the sixties and seventies really writing philosophical commentary on the culture. Uh, real philo philosophical, uh, uh, you know, original work, but then a lot of what she wrote was commentary on the culture and what was going on. Mm -hmm. uh, she died in 1982, um, and uh, the Ironman Institute was founded in 1985 uh, to, to kind of continue uh, uh, promoting her work and make sure that her philosophy uh, mm -hmm. stays uh, in the public eye and, and in the in the debate and in in the discussion and. Uh, it's still true that many young people read her book, many young people are influenced by her. And now with the internet, it's, it's an opportunity to get these ideas to even a broader, bigger, bigger audience. Mm -hmm. So that's her. We can talk about her ideas if you like next. Yeah, sure. yeah that was just my next. What we need today, what I call the new intellectual would be 
any man or woman who is willing to think. Meaning, any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect, not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the rule of the collectivist brute. All right, before we go on, reminder, please like the show. We, we've got 163 live listeners right now, uh, 30 likes. That should be at least 100. I figure at least 100 of you actually like the show. Maybe there are like 60 of the Matthews out there who hate it. But, but at least the people who are liking it, you know, I want to see, I want to see a thumbs up. There you go. Start liking it. I want to see that go to 100. All it takes is a click of a, a, click of a, a thing, whether you're looking at this uh, and, and, you know, the likes matter. It, it's not an issue of my ego. It's an issue of the algorithm. The more you like something, the more the algorithm likes it. So, you know, and if you don't like the show, give it a thumbs down. Let's see your actual views being reflected in the likes. But uh, if you like it, don't just sit there, help get the show promoted. Of course, you should also share and uh, you can support the show at yourunbookshow.com slash support or on Patreon or Subscribestar or Locals uh, and, uh, and show your support for, all, for, for, for the work, for the value hopefully you're receiving from this. And, uh, and of course, don't forget, if you're not a subscriber, even if, you, even if you just come here to troll or even if you're here like Matthew to defend Marx, uh, then uh, you should subscribe because that way you'll know when to show up. You'll know what shows are on, when they're on. You'll get notified, right? So, um, yes, like, share, subscribe, support. Like, share, subscribe, support. There you go. Easy. Do one or all of those, please.